And that's really where mystical state comes in. It's it's that positive vision of, of what can be healthy. What can a healthy culture look like? What can a healthy society look like? Welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. Today, we are pleased to have joining us Arthur Versluis. Arthur is the author, a, quite a prolific author. Um, Arthur, do you know how many books you've written off the top of your head? I, I don't keep track of numbers, no. <laughs> okay, I think it's somewhere in the, somewhere around 30 from, from what I can gather on, uh, on your website and on Amazon. Um, we recently read one of your books, and some of us are still reading it, but uh, this is the one that I first read. This was a book from 2006, I believe. Let me just double check that. Yes, 2006, The New Inquisitions, Heretic Hunting, and the Intellectual Origins of Modern Totalitarianism. And then um, I've been reading this one recently, The Mystical State, Politics, Gnosis, and Emergent Cultures. This one came out in 2011. Um, somewhat of a, a sequel of sorts to The New Inquisitions. We can get into that. And this is the only one, the only other one at the moment that I have, um, Secret History of Western Sexual Mysticism, Sacred Practices and Spiritual Marriage. This one was from 2008. Now, like I said, um, Arthur has written dozens of books, so this is only a, a tiny selection of the ones he has written. Arthur, could you tell us a bit about your background? Um, just from the titles, we can, we can get an idea of what you specialize in, um, the Western um, occult or esoteric tradition or mysticism or um, things like that. So just tell us a bit about what you study and how you got into your own field of study. How did that happen? Well, I just follow up things that I find uh, fascinating and that are understudied. So really, that's, you know, that's what governs what I do. And, and uh, my work has always crossed over between uh, religion and literature. It it is in, in the intersection of those two. And then uh, more broadly, uh, I'm interested in culture and uh, how culture develops and what culture is. That's part of what underlies uh, a number of the books. Uh, it's not always explicit, but that is, that is uh, at least implicit. Uh, I became interested in Christian mysticism quite a long time ago as one of my interests because the way Christianity was presented uh, was um, typically confessional. So primarily it's pre presented as a confessional tradition. And in other places, for example, in Buddhism and uh, Sufism, you have uh, initiatory lineages, you have lines of teachers, so teachers and students who teach a practice, some kind of practice. And I began to wonder where that was in, in Christianity. And so that led me ultimately to uh, Christian theosophy or Bumian theosophy. And so that became the basis for a series of books. And some of those are still ongoing. I have uh, one that just came out, which is a set of conversations with a, a practitioner of theosophy called Conversations in Apocalyptic Times. And that's with uh, Robert Foss, who's a, a clinical psychologist, but also a practitioner of uh, Christian theosophic alchemical mysticism. Hmm. So uh, that's an interest that has gone from the 90s when I published the first book, uh, Wisdom's Children, 1999, to the present, uh, and the present being uh, the co-authored book with Bob Foss. Well, let's get into that a little bit. Uh, I do. I want to talk about several several lines of your work, but let's zero in on that one a bit um, because I think. Because we live in, in a sense, a Christian culture, I mean, the Christian history, even if a lot of people are very secular and not necessarily, wouldn't necessarily consider them Christians these days, th within that confessional 
water that we're swimming, some people might not even realize that there is a, a mystical theosophic tradition in Christianity. So could you tell us a bit about what that is? Uh, maybe talk about Jacob Bohm and where we can actually find, find traces of this, this stream within Christianity. Sure. It uh, needs to be, uh, we need to go a little further back than Christianity, the origin of Christianity itself, uh, because uh, really what, where I would point is uh, initially the ancient mystery traditions. So for example, uh, the island of Samothrace off the coast of Greece was a mystery center for several thousand years and had an initiatory complex on it. Uh, and I've been there. I have a book about that called Entering the Mysteries. And so the mis ancient mysteries were a revelatory tradition that preceded Christianity. And the mysteries were, to some extent, influential in Platonism. So the Platonic tradition drew from the ancient mystery tradition. And then when Christianity emerged, uh, Christianity had a, a mystery religion dimension to it. Christ rose from the dead. Christ uh, is identified with light. Uh, and there also is a continuity with Platonic mysticism in that uh, Platonic uh, mysticism has as its center something called the negative way, which is pure transcendence. Uh, pure transcendence, it's not, uh, it's not sensory. It's not taste, it's not touch, it's not smell. It can't be identified conceptually uh, other than by negation. And that gets conveyed into Christianity uh, by someone named Dionysus the Areopagite. And that becomes the, the heart of Christian mysticism, really, that, tran that sheer transcendence. And it's carried on all the way through medieval period with figures like Meister Eckhart and Johannes Tauler, uh, to give two you know, major examples. And then when you get to about, that's, you know, 13th century, you get to the 17th century, about 1600, you have a German shoemaker, a cobbler by the name of Jakob Böhme. And he was an ordinary guy, I mean, uh, in many ways, but he was also absolutely extraordinary. And uh, what he did was synthesize, and it's an extraordinary story, he was living in a Lutheran town and he uh, synthesized all of these different traditions and all these different uh, uh, esoteric currents, including, for example, um, uh, alchemy. So he incorporated alchemical symbolism into his work. He incorporated all kinds of different things and created this entire uh, you could call it cosmological and metaphysical system, which is esoteric Christian and, and essentially uh, summarizes, you could say, many different pre-existing currents. And one of those is sheer transcendence. And so Burma is very important because he, he in these, in these an extraordinary books that he wrote, um, uh, outlined this, one of the ones that refers to this line I'm referring to of sheer transcendence is dialogues on the supersensual life. And so in there, he taught in that particular work, a master and a disciple are talking back and forth about what, you know, what is the supersensual life? What is beyond the physical? And uh, that's a very helpful work. And so Burma, uh, He's not easy to read. Um, he's a complex author, but he has a lot to offer. The question becomes, what do you actually do? He gives you a lot of insights, and I'm not going to go into all the details of that. But the question I would 
I would pose then is, all right, given that he has all of these alchemical and other um, themes in his work and advice to practitioners and, and so forth, what does one actually do in this tradition? And that's, that's the question mark, because if you go back to earlier forms of Christian mysticism, it's actually kind of difficult to find how, for example, Meister Eckhart, probably the greatest mystic, uh, in the certainly the Germanic tradition, but possibly in European tradition, he gives really no indication of how he got to where he was. Right? It's it's all these gnomic utterances that are just uh, clearly reflecting, you know, this this tradition of sheer transcendence. But how did he get there? We're not sure. Mm -hmm. Burma gives some advice. He does tell you some things. Uh, but it's not a, a handbook in the sense of you start at point one and you end up at point 12, right? Uh, but he does give some advice. And so he then generated an entire school across Europe in France and Germany and England. And so the library you see in the background actually is in Oxford and Oxford's library includes some of the manuscripts of these folks. And I have it here because I've been there and I've consulted those manuscripts um, directly. And so um, I've drawn on the manuscripts, I've drawn in all kinds of different things. So that's just a little thumbnail in terms of, of Burma and his uh, continuity with earlier, earlier mm -hmm. traditions going actually fairly far back. Mm -hmm. Well, you, in the mystical state, you go over some of the history. It's it's in the politics. Well, it's in the theme of politics. We'll get to that later. But you go back to some of the history and one of the earliest examples of this thread in Christianity was Basilides in like the early second century. But there were all of these, um, what came to be known as heretics and Gnostics in the Christian tradition. And it seems like in that, in the second century, there were a lot of potentially something akin to this initiatory um, lineage where there was a teacher and the teacher would have students, but they, they have almost, well, they, they were after, after a century or two, they all completely disappeared because of the anti-heretical um, bent that Christianity took with figures like, and writings like Tertullian and Epiphanius and um, Irenaeus, how um, you point out that Christianity took a very, uh, a very specific turn away from that to the point where, as you mentioned, that those themes are few and far between in, in Christianity, in, in pretty much the whole history of Christianity. We see these, these figures pop in and out and we can see threads of it. But as you mentioned in American Christianity, for instance, in the last 100, 150 years, there's been practically nothing of that sort whatsoever. Whereas even if you look at any of these other, uh, or a lot of these other religions, you'll, you'll find a, a mystical tradition that is still, still alive. Um, you mentioned Sufism. We talked to, um, um, we talked to a scholar on Ibn Arabi and, um, but if you look, if you look at the, the Sufi tradition, you've got tons of like Sufi masters all over the place and their lineages. And you've got all these, all these different streams and things like that. But again, in Christianity, it's kind of, it's almost been, it was almost blocked off from the very beginning and the few that, well, close to the very beginning and the few that have managed to come through, um, don't have a, don't have an easy time of it. Right. And I think that's, it was, was noticing that perhaps one of the, the inspirations for the new inquisitions, or was that a connection that you made while while doing that research and writing that book. Well, you're putting your, your finger on, on something that that's really, I think you're pointing to something that's really quite important. And uh, the figures that I mentioned, for example, Meister Eckhart, this extraordinary, just spiritual genius, uh, whose work, uh, when it became known in Japan, was recognized to be very similar by people who are practitioners within the Zen tradition 
and especially a Zen philosophical tradition that emerged in the mid 20th century, but also others. I met a Zen priest who uh, would be an example of that. In fact, he stayed in my house at one point. Uh, they recognize this extraordinary dimension of Eckhart, but Eckhart himself was, you know, condemned after at, posthumously condemned by, you know, uh, and uh, lapsed into obscurity. Burma, when he published his first work, Aurora, was banned from publishing anything further by his own pastor in his own church. And uh, you go back, uh, I just published a book in 2017 called Platonic Mysticism. And in fact, yesterday I, I gave a presentation at a symposium in, in Poland about that. Uh, there are some rather interesting uh, people in Poland interested in this sort of thing. And, and uh, one of the aspects of that book is that Platonism has also been, to a large extent, distorted and suppressed. So it's not only that Christianity has pushed back uh, against, largely against uh, its own mystical tradition, and suppressed it, but also more broadly within the last 50, 75 years, uh, within academia and specifically within uh, academic philosophy, you have also the uh, kind of concurrent exclusion of Platonism. And these are, these are both practic actually practical traditions and they're traditions uh, that uh, don't correspond to a materialistic worldview. So there's a there's a large set of questions here, and the book New Inquisitions came about for a couple of different reasons. One, I've had a long-standing interest in in both mysticism, but also the suppression and and why people su seek to suppress and oppress uh, and exclude. Uh, those are things that interest me a great deal, and in fact a lot of my, maybe all of my work is aimed at opening a door into things that have been not so widely made available to make them available. And that, you know, that also includes discussion of the inquisitions and inquisitional kind of pathological uh, behavior. And we see that in the inquisition, I think, but uh, in the murder of someone like Giordano Bruno, for example, uh, by the Inquisition. He was burned to death on Ash Wednesday, 1600, if you wanted a date. And uh, that kind of, I think, pathological destruction of the best requires some investigation. So I'm interested in, I guess you could say, in the best and the worst. Mm -hmm. So... Did well. I I share the same interests. Um, that's why I, I was I was I was drawn to your book. That's what that's what drew me to your book in the first place. Unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, I bought your book, uh, the New Inquisitions, back probably around two thousand eight, two thousand nine. But I never actually ended up reading it until recently. I saw it on my shelf and realized, well, you know, I really should get around to that one. It sounds like I'd really enjoy it and. So I read it and was very glad that I did. And then researching you a bit uh, and finding out where your background is I f um, and just how much our, our interests aligned, what really struck me was um, the fact that, that you'd pick the subject of totalitarianism. And, and you, I think you, you nail, you, you, you get to the heart of the matter in, in a way that few do, I think, in this book. And this is, so I thought the juxtaposition was interesting. And it makes sense, it's, it makes sense to me that someone with your your expertise would be able to, to look into the subject and kind of, and see what's going on. But what the, what New Inquisitions is, just for for those who aren't familiar with it, because we, we haven't really discussed the book, the subtitle, as I mentioned, was Heretic Hunting and the Intellectual Origins of Modern Totalitarianism. So it's a study of uh, modern totalitarianism, but then you track the the intellectual lineage through several figures, and um, and and you find the well backwards and forwards. So you look at the the Inquisition itself, uh, 
and the political theorists and philosophers who have drawn from inquisitional thinking and and how it has seeped into their thought and how that basically forms a lineage directly from the inquisition to the the philosophers and the and the the shapers of modern totalitarianism in the 20th century but you also go back to um, the figures I mentioned in early Christian history, like Tertullian and uh, and Irenaeus, and their anti-heretical works, and how it's almost like the seeds of the Inquisition were planted right back there in the second and third centuries, and they kind of come to fruition in the in the Inquisitions, um, particularly I think well in both the the Inquisitions as they manifested in France, and I th I think probably especially in the Spanish Inquisition where it was kind of um, institutionalized to a de to a greater degree i think but then even uh but even then in the 20th century all of those all of those features all of those characteristics all of those trends were almost like amplified to to this to 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 a much more massive degree so it's almost this progressive increase and amplification of of all of these tendencies it's almost like um, a snowball. It starts out as a, as, as a little flake, and then as it come as it rolls through history, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you get something like um, like Nazi Germany or the USSR or Mao's China, and use all these examples to to do that. So just um, just incidentally, I want to know if if you were also always interested in kind of these these secular totalitarianisms. And and the, your interests just kind of aligned with that, or did you kind of start with the Inquisition and and trace it like to the from from then to now? How how exactly did you did you form the thesis in in that book? Well, there's a direct line that you can trace, and you were alluding to that, and I and as you say, I do I do show that in the book that. Uh, with some of these thinkers. What I would say about that book now, um, with the benefit of what's happened in the last uh, few years in particular, mm -hmm. is that I would, uh, were I writing the book today, many aspects of it would stay the same. And fundamentally, the insights that are in there um, I would say time has confirmed them. Mm -hmm. However, there also are things that have happened that uh, would naturally fit in a in an additional chapter, and that additional chapter would be about uh, the shift from. Christianity to a secular religion. And I would give a couple examples of that. One would be the French Revolution. French Revolution as an example, kind of a secular, it's a secular movement. Um, and one of the things that happened in the wake of the French Revolution was uh, the murder of a vast number of peasants who were resistant to it. Uh, and that ha you, know, you can you can look up that history. I would I would include that, um, and from that I would take a look at what's happening now, in specifically in the United States, um, because I think there are some things that are happening that that reflect a kind of secularized, um, or a secular it's a secular civil religion, but it's still a religion, and it still has heretics. Who are the heretics? I mean, this is, you know, this is easy to see. Uh, there's a Dilbert cartoon where this is from a couple of days ago. There's a Dilbert cartoon where, um, you know, pointy haired guy hires a guy as a human sacrifice and he hangs him out a window to the woke mob. So the woke mob is down below and they put the this guy on a pole and hang him out the window. And the guy says, I'm not a racist. And the pointy haired boss says, well, you can't prove that. <laughs> Meaning you're still a good sacrifice. Who cares if you're a racist or not? Right. Mm -hmm. We just need to appease mm -hmm. the mob. That's a Dilbert cartoon. Um, so what are we talking about here? Well, 
Um, what is heresy in modern America? What's heresy? What's what's heretical to say? And you can fill in those blanks. Uh, those things uh, uh, are operative in contemporary society. There are things you can say, things you can't say. And if you say th some things, those things will hang you. So mm -hmm. that would be similar to the theme we're talking about. So in some way, I would have to do a chapter on this. I mean, I would be obligated to. I don't know how I would not mm -hmm. do it um, mm -hmm. because it seems to me evident that there is a kind of inquisitional thinking today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it manifests in different ways. Uh, but it's still the same pattern. And really, the book is about a pattern, right? Yep. At the time the book was published, uh, you had the war on terror happening and the development of the Patriot Act and all kinds of surveillance on American citizens and and abrogation of, of various um, rights and different things that had happened during that time. That was at the time of the book's publication. Now we're in a different historical moment. and uh, we we can see things that are happening, but the book is about patterns, and there are a series of patterns. You can see the patterns historically, and so it's it's uh, I would call it an exercise in pattern recognition. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, for listeners, it would be great to uh, uh, just apply, read the book, and then apply those patterns to contemporary society and see what you mm -hmm. think. What do you think? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that I would say is. <laughs> It's a it's a virtue of the book. I'm reading it, and and I I was looking at the beginning of the book. I was wondering when was this written again? 2006. Amazing. The 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 patterns that you establish, mm -hmm. beginning with the Spanish Inquisition, that get carried through and expanded into the 20th century, 21st century, uh, the Bolshevik Re Revolution, the Nazi movement. Uh, incredible. And uh, there are five dimensions or characteristics that you call uh, archetypal, which, um, which kind of define uh, the way that a, an inquisition works, whether it be under a leftist regime or a far right regime. And roughly, you mentioned that there is a juncture of uh, religious and secular power. Um, and all of these can be qualified. This is just a rough, broad uh, description of what you write. Uh, the second is the criminalization of thought. Uh, the third is the imposition of torture and the death penalty. The fourth is terrorize the population into compliance or the imposition of fear. The fifth is um, the secrecy of trials or proceedings. And it, it is this kind of pattern um, that has been, uh, well, we, we, we see them, we see how they've come into full fruition under full-blown totalitarian regimes. Um, but you can, you can get the outline of, of some of these movements uh, in contemporary culture and society right now. And I think that is one of the virtues of the book, if you're paying attention to um, contemporary events and, and news and developments with a more or less objective uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, and you, um, along those lines, the, the, the pattern that you mentioned and the pattern that uh, Ilan just went over, that's one of the, the virtues of the book, I think, because I mentioned the, it's in the title, right? The, um, and, and we mentioned the tracking the, the intellectual lineage, but, but really I think that's secondary. The, the most important thing, um, the, the lineage is interesting and it's interesting to see how, how the ideas have influenced, um, and, um, and cropped up throughout this, throughout this period of time. But what, what really stands out is the pattern and the pattern can be, um, can happen anywhere. Um, it can happen in 
in China, well, through Marxism, it can happen any anywhere in the world with any ideology. And this this reminds me of uh, um, when we were corresponding before doing the interview. I mentioned a book to you, Political Ponderology, by Andrew Lobachevsky, and this is one of the central points that he makes: is that the the ideology is just the clothing that this phenomenon wears. Um, in your book, you call it you. I can't remember who you who you got the, the the word from, but ideocracy or idiocracy, which is funny because uh, it uh, at least um, at I least know. sounds like idiocracy, the movie, the the ridiculous movie about, <laughs> you know, so so whenever I see that word, I, I have both come to mind the the actual, you know, the the intellectual, you know, academic meaning of the word, but also uh, idiocracy because it, there there are a lot of stupid people. But um, th- that that is a, an essential component of this this thing, whatever you want to call it, is there's always this ideological um, component to it. And like you mentioned, when you wrote this book, it was 2006, it was uh, the war on terror. I mean, we were we were kind of seeing the same things back there and or back then and talking about it and just how just how bad things seem seem to be going seem to have gotten and the direction things were going. And there were several people at the time um, pointing out the, the 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 trends of of just what was happening. I mean, Naomi Wolf, a famous feminist uh, uh, author, had written a book called "The End of America," pointing out all of these all of these all of these things that uh, that what was happening in the U.S. had in common with Germany before, like during the rise of Adolf Hitler. Just these these trends that were quite disturbing. But it seemed to me that what was lacking then was this actual. Um, almost tangible ideology to hold everything together. And then now, 15 years later, after, after this book was written, we see this kind of, this ideological framework that has emerged that has, that has been around and, and been, and been shaping itself for 30 plus years. Well, and you can, you can, depending on where you trace the beginnings of it, but in the universities, it's kind of like it, it was, it was, conceived in the in the universities and it's been kind of birthed into the into the media and mainstream culture especially in the last five years and you see this this idi- this strong ideological component which provides that framework for for this phenomenon this this pattern it's almost it's almost as if this pattern is is necessary for people to do those things that Elon mentioned in the, those those five things, but well, more than five. But it's almost like there are people that are just itching to start torturing and killing people, and and the the ideology is is once they've got the ideology that 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 they can use to gain um, popular support and and justify it, then like that they're going to do it, and they do it, and they've done it throughout history, and it forms a pattern. I just wanted to. Uh, do you have any comments on? Uh, you know what Alana had said, or anything that I just said. Well, it's it's certainly the case that um, there are different uh, historical examples to look at uh, that um, are invariably really disturbing. Um, how, you know, looking at the history of Cambodia, uh, the when. Uh, Khmer Rouge uh, was bringing back the young people to get them to to uh, engage in this transformation of society, and then all the murders that happened subsequent to that. How is that possible? You know, I was reading recently a book and looking at photographs. It's called Forbidden Memory, and it's it's by a Tibetan woman who discovered in her father's uh, desk. Uh, Photographs, and she started to look at the photographs and discovered that he was complicit. Her father was complicit in the invasion of Tibet, and she has. It's almost un. It you can't. It's hard for me to actually look at the photographs, uh, and what and what's in that book. And the thing is, there were Tibetans who, who were per, you know complicit. They were, they were complicit in allowing what happened to happen. And how was, how is that possible? Right. Um, what happened, you know, there are photographs of, you know, uh, llamas, Tibetan practitioners being paraded through the streets with dunce hats on, um, being taken out back and, and murdered, um, 
kicked into ditches. Um, you know, the, it was just, it's a horrific giant piles of, of manuscripts being burned, um, you know, and precious, completely irreplaceable uh, history of meditation practices and all kinds of rituals and other things being just indiscriminately destroyed and melted down. And you look at this history, this is the flip side, right? I said the best and the worst, right? The best is, in my opinion, uh, the practitioners, the people who are aiming for transformation, for uh, spiritual realization, trying to make themselves better, uh, better people, more realized people, more ethical people. Uh, that's one side. The other side is what we're talking about. And I think it's an important thing to talk about. Uh, there are historical examples. And what we're seeing now in the United States and elsewhere um, is alarming because uh, when range of views can't be um, voiced, then what you have is uh, uh, a kind of uh, enforced social code. And uh, there's a discussion of that in Cheslav Milos uh, wrote a book called The Captive Mind. And the Captive Mind uh, is an extremely valuable uh, book about how how the intellectuals were compel compelled to live under communism, under, under uh, communist uh, uh, hegemony. And one of the things that, one of the terms he uses is Ketman. Ketman is a term which effectively means uh, you create a second identity. You have the public identity, right? Which is one way. And then you, but, and you have to have that, this kind of false identity. And then your real identity is separate from that. And that's, and that's how you have to live under an idiocracy. Now, I mentioned this in the book, actually. The word idiocracy, I don't know whether I found it anywhere else. Probably I just coined it. I mean, frankly, I mean, I don't know that I saw it somewhere. Um, but the idiocracy, Yes, um, one you do have to laugh in thinking of the uh, the movie. I, I thank you for that because it's it's a movie I've been meaning to go back to and watch again. I saw it years ago, and it probably has a different resonance today, like many things do. Um, but but uh, idiocracy, I D E O C R, ruled by uh, ideological uh, fiat, as it were. Um, when you're when you're thinking about and just thinking objectively about whether, I mean, well, here are some questions. What what is the American civil religion? What are its elements? What are its characteristics? What you know, um, historically and then today, what can be said? What can't be said? Uh, I wouldn't make the argument that where we are today is is quite like what uh, Mewish was describing in Captive Mind. I don't think it's it's at that point. But what the is that you can talk about it in terms of as an analytical tool in terms of how things are in, in the United States today, and that's and that's a little surprising, really. Um, but but that's the reality, and so. Maybe that's a built-in characteristic of, uh, you know, Marxist and Marxist-derived uh, ideology. I mean, maybe that that uh, Katman is is part of what um, part of how people have to cope under a certain yeah. kind of ideology like that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the, one of the interesting things I found out about Katman is that apparently the word itself is a, a, I believe it's a Persian word, and it was a word used by the, the Persian heretics. So the, the Persian um, heterodox 
believers who who believed who might have had I don't know the total the whole history of it, but who might have had um, mystical beliefs or who might have had disagreed with the orthodoxy in some way, and so Ketman was their way of professing um, outwardly the the exoteric um, official ideology or or theology, and then keeping their own their own beliefs, their own potentially like mystical or heretical beliefs secret. And you can imagine, or you can probably um, imagine that a lot of Sufis might have had to do that at various times and in various places to basically uh, avoid the mob. Um, you you profess belief. It's it's like um, like in Nazi Nazi Germany, giving the giving the salute um, just to you know keep the what was the phrase? Keep the keep away the wolves, you know, to, to placate the crowd, the mob. And so I found, I found that really interesting that the, the phrase he used was the, was the, had the context of, uh, that, that initial context of mysticism and, and heresy. And it, it just, it fits perfectly in, in new inquisitions in your book, that, that element. And that's an element that you kind of, you developed further on in, uh, in mystical state. I think that, I think that you kind of considered this one, um, kind of like a turning point and almost, you could tell when at the very end of new inquisitions, you say, well, this is an interesting, this is an interesting opening for potential research in, into the kind of the significance of gnosis in politics. And, um, and then, so as I read that, I, I was thinking, oh, well, I hope, I hope he does that, or I hope he actually did that. So I found out, oh, well, great. You know, five years later, you did this book. And, um, well, can you talk a bit about how, how the mystical state represented this turning point and, and how it fits into, to what you're talking about today and what you're, what you're thinking about and writing about today? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting um, thing to think about, uh, think aloud about, you know, the, the mystical state is a much more optimistic book, uh, fundamentally. I mean, it's, uh, new inquisitions, uh, it discuss in, and I discuss some things that, that are, you know, fairly dark, uh, as the, as the title would suggest. And, uh, in mystical state, what I'm discussing is how, how does a healthy culture emerge? Uh, what, is, what is it, you know, what would it look like? What's it based on if, you know, uh, uh, in, in his book, uh, uh, Lobachevsky talks about, you know, a, what he calls a pathocracy. And that's what New Inquisitions is really about, pathocratic behavior. And, and we're not seeing full-blown pathocracy, uh, but we're seeing pathocratic behavior. That's how I would describe it um, mm -hmm. today. Uh, however, what amplifies, what is the amplifier of that? You mentioned the amplifier. And the amplifier is gigantism. Because if you have a gigantic apparatus, whether you grasp the levers of power or whether some uh, some something is created, um, you know, still it has to do with um, vastness. And mystical state is was really it came about in part by time that I spent in Switzerland. Uh, I was in Switzerland researching federalism and. Uh, the federalism is, is a really uh, understudied dimension of the American and the Swiss foundings. The American and Swiss foundings were, were twins. They're like twins, historically. And the Swiss ramped up uh, federalism to a slightly greater degree than uh, the United States. The United States still has state, you know, states. Um, and states have the special powers and so on. But but in Switzerland, the cantons, um, you know, and public referenda uh, really have some, so they have some force. And uh, so what you have in a kind of confederated uh, model 
is that power is devolved to a much smaller, to a much, it's much more decentralized. So your political structure being much more decentralized, um, it's much less likely to have uh, the kind of thing that we're talking about. And if it does happen, it happens on a that can be overthrown. Whereas when it's on a gigantic level, that's where you get genocide, right? Uh, or a, a much larger level. And so decentralization, there's a history of political thinkers who are decentral, decentralized uh, emphasize emphasize decentralization, and there's there's a whole kind of line of those. Decentralization is one current that I've spent a lot of time studying, and the importance of decentralization. And actually, the American uh, tradition is a decentralized, federated federated tradition uh, based on the idea originally of the yeoman farmer, the the farm family, and uh, independence, and that dimension is something that you see in Switzerland. You see that in the United States. Uh, they're twins, as it were. But then there's something else that I discuss in this book, which is uh, gnosis. And the term gnosis means spiritual insight or wisdom or awareness in particular of what I'm terming, I termed earlier, sheer transcendence or I alluded to it in terms of the negative way. Um, in, and what I'm referring to here by the term gnosis is uh, defined in the book Platonic Mysticism, and I think it's a good definition. It refers to union or transcendence of subject and object. That's a way of describing it in a, in a thumbnail, kind of thumbnail phrase the transcendence of subject and object. And that is historically the, the heart of also the Swiss state, because I talk, I talk in the book about a, a extraordinary hermit figure, a recluse figure who, who was actually at the heart of the founding of the Swiss uh, uh, political state and political theory just to a considerable extent. But you see something very similar to this in other places as well. I've been studying for the last several years. Um, I've, I have quite an array of uh, sources on Tibetan, on the Himalayan region, and especially on uh, pre-Buddhist Tibet. And uh, I'm very interested in archaic religion and archaic traditions. And I read... You know, so I've read a vast amount of material actually at this point concerning that. And so one of the things that I'm looking at it to reflect on is the difference between a decentralized model and a more centralized imperial model. And also how that ties into power dynamics. And you know, so those are things that interest me quite a bit. And to give you a very brief summary of what I'm alluding to in terms of the book, Gnosis, the, the idea within the book is that uh, a state in which you have, or a polis, because I think a polis is a better term, a community in which you have some people who are focusing their lives on spirituality, inner life, and transformative practice that forms a nucleus for a stable cultural entity or a stable cultural polis. And so that's actually, I would argue, at the heart of a healthy culture. It has that at its heart. And if the culture doesn't have any avenue of that, then you get very unhealthy things. And those unhealthy things could be any number, it could take any number of manifestations. So, for example, the French Revolution would be, a, I think, an extremely unhealthy uh, manifestation. Um, why did that come about? You know, what was and so forth? These are these are kind of ancillary questions. But in mystical state, I'm alluding at the end to a vision of what a healthy culture looks like. And that's something that we don't really think about that much, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that book, I reflect on that.
And uh, that was a, that's a turning point as a book for a number of reasons. And I'm not, not sure we'll have time to go into all of those. <laughs> well, we'll, yeah, we will have to uh, have another conversation to, because there's so much that, that I want to talk about and that we can get into, but maybe to, um, do you have time for maybe a couple more questions and, uh, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Is that cool? Arthur? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we certainly could continue for a bit. We had a brief break okay. in there. So, yeah. Well, well, I wanted to make a couple comments on what you just mentioned. One was the, the aspect of, of gigantism. That's, uh, that reminded me of something that Lobachevsky writes about in his book. He talks about, uh, he calls it macropathy, um, or macropathy. And his, his recommendation is that he, he thinks that the, this was in the eighties that he was writing this, but he thought the United States should kind of revert back to, uh, to the 13 colonies, basically divide the, the, the U S up into, into 13 like mini nations and that any, any country greater than, you know, a certain number of like tens of millions of people is, is just too big. The, the center is too far away from the, from the people and on the periphery. And it just, it creates its own kind of, um, its own kind of societal disease. And then when you combine, I think that that was a great insight that you had that it's the, it seems to have been the combination of gigantism with this pathocratic, um, like ponderogenic element that creates these, these massive systems that we've seen, of course, well, essentially evil empires, like the, the USSR was an empire, the, 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 the US is, the USA today is an empire and it has these pathocratic elements that are that are um that are at work but it hasn't it hasn't finalized into that kind of crystalline pathocratic structure like you had um like you had in the ussr or in nazi germany and so that's just an, an interesting an interesting combination um or in, an interesting insight into the things that need to or that potentially need to come together to have that uh that that archetype come to fruition um in on the subject of the united states and um, and the, like Lobachevsky's idea, there's a, I, I think he's the guy that, uh, that originated, originated it. I can't remember for sure. Colin Woodard is his name. He wrote a book called American nations on, um, and he identified, I believe 13, 13 distinct American cultures based on their history and their geography. So like the waves of immigration, um, into the original colonies. And so you have, you have different, um, and, and fairly unique, with overlap, of course, cultures. For example, you have what he calls Yankeedom. So you have the Yankee culture. You have um, that, like you have the culture tracing back to the Puritans. The cult culture tracing back to like the Quakers. Then you have the the Appalachian um, kind of mountain people who are uh, very difficult people. You could <laughs> with a with a with a very with a history of just like. Uh, Inter, essentially intertribal warfare and um, rebelliousness. rebelliousness and just very kind of very individualist. Like you, you hear stories about the, about, about the mountain people who like, you don't want to go, you don't, you don't, you just don't go up onto the mountain um, because, because of the kind of people you'll meet. But then you've got the, like the, the new Orleans um, and the, the, the kind of Cuban culture in, in Southern Florida. And then you've got the left coast, like the, the, basically the tiny strip of the, of the Western coast of, of the United States, which is so you, like, um, Western Carol, uh, California might be very different from some of the parts of like Eastern California. And th so those ideas just, um, it seems to me that there are a lot of things that would need to happen. Um, let's say in the United States, for instance, in order to approach, um, that more healthy element of, of what you're saying, like a, a culture, a healthier culture, you would need, you'd probably need to, to, to have something to, um, to increase the federalization, to, to, to increase the decentralization. You'd need to have these, um, these centers of Gnostic kind of culture, the, 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 the nuclei of the, of what you, I think you might be able to call it like the spiritual center of the, of the nation and of the culture. Um, I think like it brings to mind the term the Sufis use the poles of the world. Well, the poles of the polis, the poles of the nation that kind of the, the, the center around which the, the positive elements of the culture can, can grow and thrive. But there's basically, there's a lot of work to do. Um, do you, do you find when you're thinking about these things, when you wrote this book, do you, do you see them as, 
do you see what you're doing as kind of um, a plan to actually put into action or an idea that can just be planted for like some future, some future like post-apocalyptic um, society that's recreating, you know, that's recreating society. And it's like, okay, well, we can implement this. Like, do you, do you see it more as a, as an academic exercise and, and something that just needs to be done or something that's practical at the moment? Um, maybe we can, we can leave it on this question. Like, what is your, what is your vision for what can change and how thing, how things can change? Well, there are a couple of things I'd say. Uh, one is that there, you know, in, in response to your, the early part of what you said, uh, there is a history of people, and I've met one of them. In fact, I, I did a, I published a conversation with him. Kirkpatrick Sale uh, is an author who has been pushing for years for the um, secession movement in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, secession is, is real. I mean, it's, it is something that actually could happen. I mean, it's happened in other places in, in the world and, um, it, it can happen. There are actually, you know, um, uh, provisions to some extent for that, uh, politically. Mm -hmm. And so that, that represents not only a kind of pipe dream, but something that actually, I think, um, uh, has had does ultimately have some legs, I think, I think, uh, at some point. Um, but and certainly there's a history of people who have written about that and have been advocating for it and have analyzed the history of giant states that failed and why they failed. Uh, I have a couple of books on the shelf about that. There are also theorists who actually looked at what makes something healthy and uh, Apollos healthy. And that's something that goes way back to Plato. Plato actually uh, held that to, for something to, for a Apollos to really be healthy, it should be quite small, like a city state, uh, much smaller than 13, you know, 13 uh, giant entities within the United States. Actually, yeah. he thought it should basically be, you should know everybody, a healthy Apollos, you know, everybody, you know, and a friend of mine said, that's, you know, that's completely infeasible. Um, that's a, that's a, not a feasible theory. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, maybe it's not. Uh, Pla who said Plato was, uh, you know, a uh, rational guy after all. But, but uh, you know, um, there is some value in thinking small. And mm -hmm. I think that that's... Uh, self-evident in terms of my vision for my own work uh there are a couple ways i can respond to that one uh, a few years ago i founded a nonprofit called hyros and hyros it's h-i-e-r-o-s and there are a few of us who are involved in that and uh there are some things that we're in the process of developing for with hyros and that's you know, that's for the future, but that's for the relatively immediate future, the next next few years. Uh, then there's the other aspect, which is, you know, the there's the short view and the long view. The long view, the short view is you do what you can, right? You do what you can. You publish books, um, you, you know, you uh, do great conversations on podcasts, and, you know, you do the different things that that are possible to do today. Um, if it's possible to develop a local community, um, to develop uh, roots in a particular area in a more profound way than simply to go to the local McDonald's or something, um, but really a more deeper, um, a deeper, more, you know, a more profound connection, um, not only to the physical world, but to uh, the less visible aspects of our world, which is something that Tibetans specialized in, these are these are things that people can do now. Uh, and Hyros is intended to help encourage that. But the long vision, what's the long vision? Well, the long vision is what you're alluding to, and that is, all right, we see signs of pathocracy. Um, that is true. And given history, 
it may very well turn south in a very, very unpleasant way. That is not impossible. Uh, we know that because we can look at history and, you know, um, that's just looking at things more or less objectively. Um, but then beyond that, there are things in the human, in human nature, uh, in who we are, that uh, we are here to realize that that need to be realized. And those things are those things concern what is true, things that are true. They can, it has to do with beauty, has to do with what is good, what is the good? The great question, Plato, you know, Plato, um, uh, Socrates asked, you know, what is the good, right? And the good in the sense of flourishing, human flourishing. And human flourishing, you can look at history and you can see human flourishing. Uh, and when, you know, when people flourished and what made them flourish. And that's something that I think, regardless of the time and regardless of the circumstances, you can look toward and, and uh, reflect on. And ultimately, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point, realize in a more substantive way. And so I would, I would say yes to both of those questions, really, all three of them, because, you know, of course, I'm an academic. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, I, that's one of my roles. Um, but before I was an academic, I was an author. And, you know, writing books for me is more, it's, it's something that I do because I love to do it. You know, a lot of people, they write and they complain and, and, you know, they're complaining about writing and, you know, also I don't complain about it. I don't always do it. Uh, that is right. Uh, but when I do write, uh, you know, there, there are cycles. Sometimes you write, sometimes there, it's a fallow cycle where things are gestating and developing. But, you know, I love to do it. And then once it's gone out into the world after editing and those other things, then it takes on its own life beyond you. Mm -hmm. And it has its own kind of surprising course through the world sometimes. And you just don't know. You just don't know. You know, so for example, the other day I got a call from somebody who uh, is a son of, son of a, uh, you know, an author who's, who's fairly well known and he, he wanted to do something, do an event. And, and he said, well, um, he had read the mystical state, <laughs> you know, uh, of all books and that thought mm -hmm. that that was, you know, and, and wanted to talk about it. And this, this happened just a few days ago. And, and I thought, huh, okay. So there's a natural kind of organic pattern to different things, including, my getting like five podcast inter interview requests in like, you know, a week and a half. Um, oh, wow. You know, why? I mean, I have no idea, really. Um, why? Where would he have come across mystical state? I'm not sure. And my point is, you know, he just did and, and it resonated with him. And so, you know, now we're going to have this conversation. And so you have this kind of life of ideas in the world. Mm -hmm. And I see that, yeah, as extremely valuable because it's very easy to become depressed nowadays, actually. And, and to see, think, to see what's happening and think, you know, you shake your head. And yet uh, there are things that are positive happening right at this moment and things that, that we can engage in that are positive in a vision that's positive. And that's really where mystical state comes in. It's, it's that positive vision of, of what can be healthy. What can a healthy culture look like? What can a healthy society look like? Uh, and I think part of it is it needs a spiritual path. If a society is engaged in, in um, persecuting people who are engaged in spiritual life, that's a pretty good sign. It is a pathocracy, okay? And um, I don't care what society it is. Right. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference to me, really, frankly. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, the burning of Giordano Bruno in Italy or or, you know, the uh, mob attacking the, you know, the Theosophic Society, the Theosophic uh, mystical practitioners in in London. 
or, you know, the, I mean, there's many examples, uh, but in the end, a healthy society has a path, a spiritual path or paths for people to realize their true nature, right? That is a, that is a signal indicator. If it doesn't have that, then you, and if it persecutes that, that is a really good sign that something is seriously wrong. And there's a, there's actually a long history. I mean, you go back to the death of Socrates, right? There's a long history of, of, um, you know, uh, um, not creating an avenue for uh, uh, wisdom in, in life to flourish. And we need to be more mindful of that. And that's part of what my work does, right? And I'm not sure that that's necessarily a popular theme. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that what I'm talking about, what we've discussed during this is necessarily the most popular thing to be talking about. But, you know, that's just how it is. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'd like <laughs> to comment on that because uh, there's so much in what you just said and the undercurrents of uh, your book that I do hear echoed and uh, shared um, in, in our more kind of open-minded uh, spheres of, of thinking and media and writing. And um, it seems to me that that your ideas, like you, you had invitations to five podcasts in this short span of time. It's as though with all of the totalitarian, pathocratic uh, flourishings and pressures that are now coming to bear and are becoming more and more, uh, that are bre- breaching the surface and becoming more obvious to many and more visceral in the experience of many, that uh, the time has come, in a sense, uh, for what you see and what you understand to be shared with a greater audience for those who have uh, the, the eyes to see and the ears to hear your message. So uh, I propose that there is this kind of you know, balancing force that, that seems to exist among people, among societies, that emerges at just just the moment uh, it, it's required the most. And heck, I mean, we have these god awful examples of of how the the counteracting forces haven't been able to uh, triumph and succeed against the the encroaching uh, forms of totalitarianism. But who knows? Maybe, maybe this time uh, there is. Uh, we have, with the hindsight of many people uh, uniting in this shared understanding, uh, a uh, a better chance, a better uh, opportunity to respond constructively and to um, make a show of of what we uh, know and care about in a way that is uh, felt. And and um, and can be grown. And that's uh, if I can interject hmm. uh, along those lines. Uh, you know, humanity has been around for several thousand years, and when we had a we had a, a podcast that we just did last week with uh, Philip Barlag, where we were going over the evil Roman emperors and just the 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 sheer brutality of some of the. Uh, the Roman rulers is just mind boggling. And so you consider that that is the state of affairs generally throughout history. And so even with all the millennia of, of horrors, here we are, you know, talking about, we made it this far. We've made it this far. (laughs) They haven't killed us yet. So, uh, you know, that's, that's inspiration in itself. Well, I, I think, the way you, the point that you just made, Arthur, is is a great place to to end for today. So I want to just again go over some of your books. We were talking today about New Inquisitions and the the mystical state, but you did mention your latest book that I believe just came out this year, just a uh, just a month or a month or two ago. Um, there's this one um, that is Conversations in Apocalyptic in Apocalyptic Times with Robert J. Foss. Um, 
maybe we haven't read that one yet, but ho hopefully I'll be getting it pretty soon and we can, we can read it and then maybe we can, we can talk about that one, uh, sometime in the, in the near future and continue our conversation that we were having today. How does that sound, Arthur? That sounds great. You know, I, I, you know, really appreciate your observations and your, you know, your, your, uh, uh, thinking, you know, I, I think we've come to very similar, um, uh, places, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of um, perceiving, you know, how we perceive things and conversations in apocalyptic times it, in many ways pulls together uh, the different strands that we've had uh, that we shared during this conversation, because it's a book. Uh, the reason that I that I did that book with him is uh, I've known him for a long time and he's the only practitioner of Christian theosophic mysticism, alchemical practitioner that I've met. And he also has a, a very clear awareness, as you'll see in the book, of, you could say, criminal dynamics, because he was actually, for some time, the consulting psychologist for uh the entire region um, for criminal psychology. So every time somebody was brought in for some, you know, some uh, heinous act, he would be the one who would be doing the evaluation. And so oh, wow. he's had a, he's had a close look. And then later he went into to private clinical practice for many decades and uh, leads a group. And so we did this book uh, in order to essentially make make available his perspective to make make available, you know, to answer the question in part to answer the question at a very, a very simple level, what do you actually do? Right? What do you do? How do you start? And so that's why the subtitle of that book is a guy, a guide for spiritual seeker, right? For the spiritual seeker, meaning, and here we're not talking about complex, you know, complex processes of visualizing this. And, you know, you know, it's and and it's it's a very um, the first thing in the book is actually uh, to give yourself some space for silence in your life, because we have all of this stuff beeping at us and honking at us and flashing at us and shouting at us all the time. Right. How do you get, you know, how do you start? Well, that's a good place to start is having a little bit of, you know, and so uh, it starts on that kind of that level and then it moves through transformative uh, practice. And that's informed by his decades of clinical work as a, as a practicing psychologist, but also from a mystical perspective. Um, so it's a very unusual book and it's in dialogue form. Uh, so it's really a conversation and, um, I look forward to talking about it with you because it's, it's, a uh, it's, a uh, it was a challenging book to create for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but I'm very happy that it came out and, uh, Great. Well, I'd, I'd love to discuss it with you. I think we could bring together all of the themes plus the theme of, um, the question of the nature of evil, because that's something that he and I have some things to say about. And uh, uh, in the next conversation, that's something we could really talk about. Uh, All right. I sneak peek. Good with that. Great. Well, yeah, we can't wait to read it and can't wait to talk to you again, Arthur. So once again, uh, we've been talking to Arthur Versluis. It's been a pleasure. Um, Arthur, hope you have a, a great day, great week, great month, great year. And um I hope you publish many more books. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate okay. it. It's been a great conversation. Talk to you All later. Right, take care. Bye.